Well, good morning. It's good to see each of you here today, and i um, glad that you're able to navigate the, the traffic uh, for the vaccine uh, in the neighborhood. And um, someone made the comment, boy, there's a long line of cars ready to line up for church this morning. Uh, I was thinking, you know, we should have someone after people get their vaccination passing out church information to them. Uh, but anyways, it's good to have you. I'm glad that you're able to um, it was just a little different than normal, but thank you for being here this morning. We're going to start off with our first hymn this morning, Like a River Glorious, page 121, if you're using the hymn books. We're going to sing that first and third stanza. If you would stand with me as we sing this morning. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace over victorious in its bright increase perfect yet it floweth fuller every day perfect yet it groweth deeper all the way stayed upon Jehovah hearts are fully and rest every joy or trial falleth from above traced upon our dial by the son of love we may trust him wholly all for us to do they who trust him Find him holy true. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed. Finding as he promised, perfect peace and rest. Aren't you thankful that it is possible through the Lord Jesus Christ to find that perfect peace and rest? We'll continue with the wonderful singing this morning, page 125, The Solid Rock. The Solid Rock, we'll sing that first and fourth stanza. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I trust the sweetest name, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Brother Ralph, could you open us in a word of prayer, please? Thank you. You may have a seat. Wanted to draw your attention to a, to, to a few announcements from the bulletin. Uh, this morning we did start our Sunday school time period for the children, teens, and the adults. And uh, I know the teens got sticky buns and hot chocolate. And uh, the children's Sunday school class had a good, exciting uh, lesson this morning. Our adults, we started in the book of Daniel. And uh, so we're excited about that to continue that next Sunday. Uh, this coming uh, Saturday, we'll continue with our, our visitation. Now, the bulletin says 10.30 a.m. It is actually 10 a.m., so that's a typo in the bulletin. 
We had a great group out yesterday, and we look forward to going out and inviting folks to church as well. Next Sunday evening will be our Lord's Supper service. That'll be in the evening service, and the whole service will be de dedicated to that. And there's some information about the men's conference in our evangelistic campaign, Perfect Peace with God Forever. Um, we're doing that on Wednesday nights, watching video training for that. Also wanted to share just an email I received from Jeremy Rowland from Baptist Church Planning Ministry. Uh, today, they're starting a church plant in Gatlin, Tennessee, and uh, the church's um, pastor name uh, there is, let's see here, how about I just read the email? Please pray for the next church plant in Gallatin, excuse me, not Gatlin, Gallatin, Tennessee, with a Get Acquainted meeting scheduled for today through the 11th. The new church is City Light Baptist Church with Pastor Caleb Terry, his wife Megan, and their son Judah. The reproducing church is Lighthouse Baptist Church in Theodore, Alabama, under the leadership of Pastor Randy Tiwell. It has been encouraging to see many local Tennessee pastors cooperating to assist with this new plant. Please pray for the evangelism and advertising that are taking place and that God would build his church in Gallatin. And so Brother Roland is there, and they're helping uh, with those Get Acquainted meetings. So that's something we did 11 years, a little over 11 years ago, and so we're excited about uh, this new church, church plant in Tennessee. We'll continue with our singing this morning, and our next song is going to be page 97. Page 97, I Need Thee Every Hour, we'll sing the first and the fourth stanza. I need thee every hour, most precious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. I need thee every hour, most holy one. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed Son. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. And our last hymn this morning, page 100, day by day. We'll sing that first and that third stanza. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Trusting in my Father's wise bestowment, I've no cause for worry or for fear. He whose heart is kind beyond all measure Gives unto each day what he deems best Lovingly it's part of pain and pleasure Mingling toil with peace and rest Help me then in every tribulation so to trust thy promises, O Lord, that I lose not faith's sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when toil and troubles meeting, ere to take as from a father's hand. One by one, the days of moments fleeting, till I reach the promised land. Amen. Cindy will be playing a special, and then uh, we'll have a special from Jody and Angelina and Kylie this morning.
life seems gentle and blessings flood my way. I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward with words you long to Thank you for that special, ladies, and um, I wish that I could show you all uh, the looks on your faces, like while they were singing. Um, uh, you were very um, joyful and pleasant, and uh, so that was wonderful. Now, I don't know why it isn't like that when I'm up here, but <laughs> maybe I do know. But anyways, um, thank you so much, and... Um, whether it is in times of calmness or it's in times of storm, may we always have that dependence upon the Lord. Lord, I need you. Well, at this time, we're going to dismiss our children for Children's Church with Mrs. Warner this morning. There you go. Rest of us, if you could please take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're continuing in our series in the book of Ephesians, and uh, this morning, Lord willing, we'll finish our three-part mini-series in the book of Ephesians on the believer in wine or the believer in alcohol, and we've already spent the last two weeks looking at Ephesians 5, 18, where it says, and be not drunk with wine, where it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what exactly does what, what exactly is God desiring for us? Well, we, we look back a couple uh, verses to verse 15 where Paul encourages us to walk circumspectfully, not as fools, but as wise. Verse 17, wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So God desires for believers to walk carefully, to walk circumspectfully, alertly, being wise, not as fools, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Well, what is the will of the Lord? Verse 18 tells us, Be not drunk with wine where it's in excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So God's will is for believers not to be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit of God. Uh, we've looked at several things in the last two weeks. Last week we looked at uh, drunkenness being very clearly condemned in the Bible. And as you look at different verse passages, you find clearly that the Bible speaks 
in a condemnatory manner towards drunkenness. But then as we introduce a little bit of the just the difficulty for deciding today is there is also the commendation of drinking specifically wine as the Bible uses it. And so while the Bible condemns drunkenness in the same context, it commends wine, the drinking of wine. First Timothy 5, 23, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Proverbs 31, 6 and 7, give strong drink unto them that is ready to perish and wine unto those that be of a heavy hearts. Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. And so while it seems like there may be a contradiction or a difficulty, how do I decide as a believer whether or not I should drink wine or alcohol today? Uh, we concluded last Sunday with looking at one question of seven questions, so we're going to finish the other six questions this morning, one question that a Christian can ask himself about this issue about the believer in alcohol. Uh, what we looked at last week was, is drinking wine today the same as drinking wine in Bible times? So when Paul says, drink no longer water, but use a little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities, is the wine that Paul was talking about back in the New Testament almost 2,000 years ago, the same wine that if you were to go to a grocery store or to a, a pharmaceutical or a, a pharmacy store or something along that lines where they sell bottles of wine, is that the same wine? Well, we looked at last week, and we, we're not going to go through it all again, but just by way of review, we looked at the biblical words for wine, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And, and the most common used word in the Old Testament and the New Testament is a generic word, which could mean anything from freshly squeezed grape juice or actually um, juice that is still in the, the grape itself or that which could be fermented. So we looked at the different words and meanings on the, both the Hebrew and also the Greek. Um, we also looked at some historical data regarding wine of how it was actually possible without refrigeration to preserve wine, to preserve grape juice, so that way it did not become fermented. And we looked at four different methods that they use. And then we talked a little bit about fermented wine. And even talked about how um, some of the, the Greek writings talked about this process. And so wine, the wine, the, the freshly squeezed grape juice would be starred, stored in large jugs, and after some time, that would become fermented. And so from that large jug, they would take some of that fermented wine out and put it into a bowl, then they'd mix water in it. Then from the bowl, not the jug, they would pour into cups, and they would drink it. So that was the common use of, of the, the procedure and we talked a little bit about the ratios, um, and, and because the, the fermented wine was mixed with water, um, you would have to drink of that mixed water and fermented wine. You'd have to drink it all day in order to even begin to be intoxicated. And so the answer from not only the biblical meanings, but the historical data to that question, is the wine in the Bible the same as the wine today? And the answer to that is no. Uh, there is a difference, quite a difference. The second question that we're going to look at this morning is this. Is drinking wine, alcoholic beverages today, is drinking alcohol the best choice? The best choice. Um, most of the time, we always want the best, right? And when it comes to our walk with the Lord, we should desire the best choice. And certainly we as believers are faced with many different choices that we make on a daily basis. So is drinking alcohol, drinking wine, the best choice for me as a believer to choose? Well, let's take a look at the standard in the Bible. Uh, there was, uh, in the Old Testament, there was a higher standard for the Old Testament priest. Uh, so we're talking about just... Uh, the general use of the word wine, which could not have been uh, in fermented, so you couldn't have gotten alcohol, um, you could not have gotten drunk on it 
Um, actually, that, that would be for the Nazarite vow, but for the Old Testament priests and the kings and the princes, there was a higher standard. Listen to Leviticus 2.9, where it says, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when ye go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. And so the, for the priests and Levites, when they were ministering, uh, they were told not to be drinking this wine and possibly the, the fermented type of wine and getting drunk because then they would pervert the judgment of God. Uh, there was a higher standard for kings and princes. Proverbs 31, 4 and 5, It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Uh, God did not desire for the kings and for the princes for their judgment to be clouded. Uh, the verse 6 talks about giving strong drink to them that are ready to perish. It was used as a sedative for the pain. Uh, so the standard in the Old Testament for the Old Testament priests and for the kings and for the princes was that they were not to drink wine because it could affect, could cloud their judgment. Now the higher standard is found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 and 5, and this would be for the Nazarite vow. And as far as we know, there were three that had a lifetime Nazarite vow, um, Samson, uh, Samuel, and Samuel, and John the Baptist. Listen to the Nazarite vow description in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord... So the whole idea is there was a separation of this person. It could be for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, or even for a lifetime. But they are consecrating, they are dedicating themselves unto the Lord and to the service of the Lord. Verse 3, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and shall drink no, long, no vinegar of wine or vinegar of the strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husk. All the days of the vow of his separation there shall no razor come upon his head until the days be fulfilled in the which he separateth himself unto the Lord. He shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. So for the Nazarite vow, there was a choice. Anyone could choose that. Now, we know Samson, it was chosen for him from actually his mother's womb. Another powerful verse to talk about how the sanctity of life within the womb. Okay, Samson's mom could not um, drink of the, of the vine because it would affect um, the, the, the life of Samson inside the womb. Um, the word Nazarite in the Hebrew actually means consecrated one. And those who took the Nazarite vow were consecrated unto the Lord. Uh, the character of the Nazarite vow, they could no longer drink of the vine, anything from the vine, including wine, and they could no longer cut their hair. Uh, this was uh, the highest level of consecration involving total abstinence. Uh, there are some verses in the Bible that talk about how, while God raised up some specific people that took the Nazarite vow, how they were corrupted. Uh, the prophet Amos said, But ye gave the Nazarites wine to drink, and commanded the prophets, saying, prophesy not. And so there was a time period when the prophet of Amos was prophesying uh, that the Nazarites had attempted to be corrupted by being offered wine and actually drinking it. Um, certainly there's different contrasts. Jeremiah contrasts the disobedience of Israel with the obedience of the Rechabite family in Jeremiah 35 verses 2 through 6 where the whole family chose to abstain from wine. What was that? It was a level of devotion and of commitment to God. So in the Old Testament, we see the priests and Levites, we see the kings and the princes, and we see the Nazarites, a, a, a standard of dedication, of commitment. What about the New Testament? Peter describes the relationship of the believer to God in 1 Peter 2.9. But ye are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
So, it, it, and while there is a level of dedication and commitment for those that would be in the ministry as a pastor, as a teacher, uh, and there is greater condemnation for them because then they're a place of authority and leadership and teaching. But when it comes to believers in general, there is a high level of commitment, of dedication that God desires for us to make to him. Paul said it like this in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and that perfect will of God. What is the best choice for the believer in alcohol, for the believer in wine today? Perhaps the best choice is to decide to choose to give yourself in fully commitment and dedication to the Lord and to abstain from drinking wine and alcohol. Question number three, is drinking wine or alcohol habit forming? Is it habit forming? Many things can become habitual that are beneficial. Um, loving your wife is good habit to have as Christ loved the church. Um, reading your Bible daily is a good habit to have. Telling others about Christ is a good habit to develop in your life. But not all habits are good. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So would drinking wine or drinking alcohol have the ability to trip me up or to entangle me? Does alcohol have the potential of bringing a person under its influence, under its power? Does it have the, does it have the capacity to produce dependence upon it and to interfere with um, the, the individual's brain and body functions? Well, I think we should know, we all know the obvious answer to that. Certainly, uh, drinking wine, alcohol could be habit-forming and could affect um, our, our ability to control ourselves. Uh, not only would a believer want to avoid sin, but the potential for sin. An example of this would be food. If a person cannot control the intake of their food, they are in the danger of becoming gluttonous. And, and certainly that would be a sin, um, just like someone who has been controlled by wine or alcohol. Um, now, it, it's a little bit, it's not a complete oranges to oranges illustration because food is necessary for us to live, right? Um, but we should not be mastered by food. So is it the best choice? Is it habit forming? Question four, is drinking wine or alcohol potentially destructive? Does it have the power to destroy? Well, the Bible says several things. Proverbs 21, wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Deuteronomy 21, 20, and they shall say unto the elders of his city, this our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. Isaiah 28, 7 and 8, but they also have erred through wine and through strong drink or out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred through strong drink. They are swallowed up of wine. They are out of the way through strong drink and they err in vision. They stumble in judgment. Habakkuk 2, 15 and 16. Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him, and makest him drunken also, that they mayest look on their nakedness. By the way, this, this is just a thought, and you can meditate upon it and chew it. But as a believer, it would be very difficult to work in a place where you are serving alcohol or where you are handling alcohol. And, and I would think that this would be a, a great passage that you could go to for that. And, and I understand there's a lot of dynamics out there. Well, you know, it's a job I've had for years, or I, I can't, you know, this is the only job I can get. Well, really, it's, it's between you and the Lord, but there is a strong admonition and warning for those that give others 
a drink. Continue, it says, Thou art filled with shame for glory. Drink thou also, and let thy foreskin be uncovered, and the cup of the Lord's right hand shall be turned unto thee, and shameful spewing shall be on thy glory. Genesis 9, 21, speaking about Noah, and he drank of the wine, was drunken, and was uncovered within his tent. So is there the potential, if I as a believer drink alcohol or wine, is there potential for there to be destruction in my life or in the life of others? Well, I think the answer is very clear from scriptures. Uh, statistical evidence, these are t this is taken from Dr. McMillan's book, None of These Diseases. First of all, alcohol produces mental destruction. It's been estimated that 20% of all patients admitted into mental hospitals have a problem with alcohol. There's also physical destruction to yourself. Alcoholism causes cirrhosis of the liver, which in turn can cause a ballooning of the veins and esophagus. The thinned out veins are then prone to rupture when food is swallowed, potentially causing a serious or even fatal hemorrhage. To others, alcohol is not only potentially harmful to people who drink it, but also has a detrimental effect on the lives of innocent people. A study of autopsy findings in Middlesee County, New Jersey, showed alcohol was a factor and 41.2% of violent deaths in America. A study in Delaware indicated that alcohol is the cause of nearly 50% of traffic deaths. In New York City, a joint study made by the State Department of Health and Cornell University revealed that 73% of the drivers responsible for the accidents in which they had died had been drinking. In West, Westchester County, New York, blood tests were done on 83 drivers and on, on 83 drivers show were, who were killed in single vehicle accidents. The tests revealed that 79% of those drivers were under the influence of alcohol. So a fair question for me to ask as a believer, is drinking alcohol or wine potentially destructive to my life and to the life of others? I believe the answer is yes. Uh, number five question, is drinking wine or alcohol offensive to other believers? Is it offensive to other believers? And some will be very quick to say, I have liberty in Christ. Paul even said, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith um, Christ hath made you free, and be not tangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know what, I'm tired of all these legalistic Christians who are just so easily offended because I choose to have wine when I eat out. Or I choose to pick up a pack of whatever whatever at the grocery store. You, know, you just need to get over it. I have freedom in Christ. Well, and, and I was a little, I hope you saw the sarcasm or the facetiousness in that. I, I certainly wasn't being genuine. Uh, there may be some believers that would have that mentality, but certainly that is not in line with the scriptures, is it? I mean, should we be concerned about other brothers and sisters in Christ and their walk with the Lord? 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says this, But take heed, lest, any, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. You know, we do have liberty in Christ, but when it becomes harmful to another believer when it becomes a stumbling block, then we need to seriously evaluate. In the day of which the Apostle Paul wrote this, drunkenness was commonly associated with pagan religions. And while that new believer may not have realized that the wine that they were drinking was not from the big, large bottle or vase container, but it was from the bowl, and it had been mixed with water, but all they saw was that they were drinking wine. And all of a sudden, it's becoming because of what they were saved out of. And because they had gone quickly and frequently before they were saved to the, the fermented wine without it being mixed, all of a sudden, my liberty in Christ, drinking an unfermented beverage, is becoming a stumbling block to another believer. <clears throat> if you would please turn with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Here, the Apostle Paul talks a little bit more in specific about this, uh, the liberty that we have and the stumbling block principle in Romans chapter 14, verse 13, says this, Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, 
But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, so there's nothing wrong with the meat that you're eating. Okay, you know that meat offered in a, in, a, in a sacrifice to an idol, you know that that idol is not alive. And you've got just good meat discounted price. But listen to verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou charitably? Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of them. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? (coughs) Hast it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which, which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So there is the offended brother. Most of the Gentile believers that Paul was writing to in the church, they had come from a background of drunkenness, of drinking the fermented wine. That background was involved with immorality and debauchery and gluttony and all sorts of evil. And it could be very possible that they could be offended by the believer's liberty. It's not fermented. It's not got an alcoholic content. It's been mixed with water, and I have liberty to drink it. Well, is that liberty? Am I walking charitably towards my brother who is offended? Verse 19 says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things which wherewith one may edify one another. So you have the offended brother. (coughs) You also have the weaker brother. If a believer sees another believer drink, they may be assuming they may assume drinking must be right and they themselves may end up addicted to alcohol. Would I want my liberty to cause another believer to become addicted? And the loving brother certainly thinks of other believers instead of tearing them down. So will drinking wine or alcohol cause another brother to sin? Question six, will drinking wine and alcohol harm my Christian testimony? Will I be able to pass out that gospel track at that restaurant ordering that alcohol? Invite that person to um, a perfect peace forever with God with a 12-pack of alcohol in my cart. Would it harm the testimony of Christ for someone to see me For a neighbor to see me on my back porch, drunk on alcohol, and having a good old time, and then a few days later inviting them to come to church, or trying to share the gospel with them. Uh, Certainly, it affects our testimony, and we want to make sure that we're not harming our Christian testimony. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and verses 31 through 33 Uh, Paul says to the church of Corinth, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. So even if I, as a believer, am making the choice whether or not to drink alcohol or wine, can I do it and bring glory to God? Look at verse 32. Give none offense, neither to Jews nor the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Is drinking alcohol offending an unbeliever or a believer? (laughs) And then verse 33. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but I don't get drunk. It's just for nostalgia. It's just because I like the taste of it. What does verse 33 says? Even as I please all men and all things, not seeking mine own profit, 
but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Three priorities from 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33, to glorify God, to offend no one, and to make sure the lost see a difference in our lives. The last question for us this morning, question seven, am I absolutely certain that drinking wine and alcohol is right? Am I absolutely certain of it? Am I convinced in my heart? Uh, Back in Romans chapter 14, the Apostle Paul uh, says this, Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself, verse 22, before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, Paul says say this, that there are some people that um, are, are very in tune to their conscience, and in tune to right and wrong. And we could even use the word may have an overly sensitive conscience to where it's not God that's convincing them and condemning them, it's themselves. So I preface that because this verse would be very difficult for some folks like that, that just are always questioning everything. You know, am I doing this in faith? That's not necessarily the group that we're talking about here. Uh, While they should be able to do things in faith, it's not self-condemning, but it is, okay, is God the one that's condemning me, not myself? But a fair question for us as Christians is, if is my drinking this alcohol, am I absolutely certain that this is the right thing? Or is this little nagging conviction that, is there a doubt that I'm having about it? And by the way, you go through the first six questions to ask, and I, I think you know the direction that I believe and that I stand when it comes for a believer drinking alcohol or wine. I don't believe it's right. I believe it's a sin. But as you look at these things, honestly, and asking the Lord, is there a doubt that the Holy Spirit is putting in your heart? Uh, Listen to this illustration. There was once a man who said to a pastor, I occasionally have a beer with the boys. Is that really that wrong? The pastor said, well, what do you think? The man said, well, I don't think it's wrong, but it bothers me. Do you like being bothered? The man said, no, I don't. The pastor said, well, you know how to stop being bothered. The man said, stop drinking. The pastor said, yes. And again, we're talking talking about alcohol and wine this morning, but it goes to every area of our life, right? Um, We should have faith. We should be able to do things without doubt. I, I'm about ready to make this purchase. Is there any doubt that this is the right thing? Oh, man, I got so much pressure. There's only this little limited time window to get this deal. But, boy, I've got this nagging doubt that this may not be the best thing for us for right now. Can I do it in faith? God's given us a conscience to help alarm us to guard against sin. What happens when we say no to that conscience? It becomes easier and easier to sin. As 1 Timothy 4, 2 says, some having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So bringing it all down, and next Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to talk about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. Uh, Something that in, in, I know my Christian life, I'm far from. As I said in Sunday school, desiring to be consistent in the decisions that I'm making. But that's for next Sunday. But as we close this out, I I hope that we see Paul's desire from Ephesians chapter 5, that we are to be circumspectly, not not to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, how can I be wise? I don't want to be ignorant, but I want to understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine, where in its excess, don't be controlled by the influence of alcohol, but be controlled, be filled by the Spirit of God. And by the way, as we continue in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to see how that will dynamically impact and affect every relationship 
of our life. Well, I hope that your desire this morning is to not be foolish, to not be unwise, but, but, to, but to be wise, to know the will of the Lord and to be filled with the Spirit. Let's bow for prayer. God, I, I thank you for this a series of messages that we've done on the believer in alcohol. And I realize that there's many thoughts about that in the world today and even in good Christian churches that preach the gospel and that are separated. But, Father, I pray that there would not be confusion in our hearts and our minds. And as we've, we've tried to look at what the Bible has to say about this issue, certainly drunkenness is condemned in the Scriptures. And we've looked of what it means when it's the wine is commended in the Bible. Uh, but Father, I pray that you'd help us to go through this series of seven questions in helping us make the choice about our lives. Is wine different today from what it was in Bible times? Well, certainly it is. Is drinking wine or alcohol, is that the best choice? Is it ha habit forming? Can it be destructive? Could it cause another brother to sin and stumble? Could it harm my testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ? Am I absolutely certain that this is right? And God, while we've been talking about alcohol and wine, God, would you help us to apply it to every area of our life and to have faith and certainty? I pray these things in Christ's name. With our heads bowed, and her eyes closed. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Cindy to play through uh, just a, a few stanzas of the hymn of invitation. But I, I, I just wonder this morning, I, I realize that this is a very uh, personal issue, wine and alcohol. But I wonder if there would be anyone here this morning that would say by an upraised hand, Pastor, God has convinced my heart through the teaching and preaching of God's word that wine and alcohol should not be a part of my life. It may never have been. It may have been before I was saved. It may have been since I've been saved. But based upon what the Bible has said and going through these questions, I am convinced that it's not right for me as a believer to drink alcohol. And heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to ask no one else to be looking around. The live stream's not panning around to see who's raising their hand or not. But if you could say that as just, I'm convinced, and I'm, I'm, this is where I'm drawing the line. For me, it's no. For wine, for, for alcohol. God's convinced me of that. As a testimony of that decision, could you just raise your hand right there where you're at? God spoke to my heart. Good. Good. Father, I, I pray that you would help each one of us right where we're at. And Father, I pray that we would be fully persuaded. And I pray that you would, you would work in our hearts, in our lives. I pray these things in Christ's name. With our heads still bowed and our eyes closed, let's stand together as the piano plays. Would you respond there at your seat? If you'd like to pray here at an altar, you're welcome to do that as God speaks to your heart. Father God, as the hymn of invitation was playing, 
You can only have peace and complete rest when your all on the altar is laid. Is your all on the altar a sacrifice laid? Does, do you have control? Does the Spirit of God have control in our lives? God, I pray that in this area of alcohol and wine, and in every area of our lives, that you would have control. Bless us now as we dismiss. We look forward to meeting again together tonight in our evening service as we look at the concept of stewarding our resources for your honor and your glory. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a great afternoon.